the risen Lord our resurrection life. There's going to be a lot of sermons this Easter Sunday morning on the resurrection. Our emphasis, as really all emphasis should be, is not, even, not just on the historical reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as wonderful as that is. It's not on the evidence of the deity of Jesus Christ as a result of that resurrection. As wonderful as that is and as necessary as it was that Jesus Christ was the God-man. Our emphasis is not, ne neither will it simply be that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as Paul declared to the Corinthians, you and I can look forward to experiencing a resurrected body to be with him eternally, as glorious as that is. So we thank God for all of those emphases that are typically discussed on Easter morning. And they typically are discussed over and over and over every year. Our emphasis, as the title suggests, is the risen Lord, our resurrection life. You see, Easter is the climax of the Christian year. But do you know why? Why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ so important to the Christian gospel? Well, to kind of draw us into this discussion, and you can be feel free to make comments or ask questions as we go through this, I've given you a little pop quiz. I don't know if you're like me. When I was in school, I never liked pop quizzes. I never liked quizzes or tests, period. <laughs> so, But here is one for you. Uh, if you were asked to pick one of the following categories to indicate what your first and primary thought would be when someone mentioned the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what would you pick? And so you have an opportunity to choose there with your handout. Is it one, an empty tomb with grave clothes inside? Is it two, life conquers death? Three, the resurrection of our bodies is guaranteed? Or four, Christ can be our life and live in us? How'd you find yourself answering? Well, this is the kind of quiz that I wish that I've gotten in school. None of those answers are wrong. <laughs> this is the kind of quiz I like to take. All of them are correct answers. And while none of them is a wrong answer, each of them obviously has a legitimate perspective and are in fact associated with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're gonna kind of emphasize something that maybe is overlooked. Often the resurrection is used uh, by preachers and theologians alike to defend the historical reality of Christ's resurrection. And as I earlier mentioned, to defend the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, while both of these are truthful realities, they miss, I believe, the most important reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and frankly his purpose for having risen from the dead and that's going to be our consideration this morning as you can tell by this next slide for our consideration we shall consider the ultimate objective and the hope of the Christian gospel which was accomplished in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice that the ultimate objective is not simply to get you and I into heaven. It's not simply that you and I would have a future residence and a glorified body. Those things are true. But that's not the most significant reality of why Jesus did what he did. 
the objective of the Christian gospel is to allow, don't miss this, it is to allow the restoration of God's life to man in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the significance of this. Allowing his life to be lived out in our behavior now, this moment, currently, as you and I are on our way to heaven. In other words, this is not just wasted time. This is the time of our lives that we get to experience the indwelling reality of the resurrected life of Jesus Christ himself. Obviously, the adversary would distract us from that realization, don't you think? That's the main thing. So, as we consider this morning, as all Christian theologians agree, there are three primary events in the life of Christ. You probably all can recite them very easily if you've attended Sunday school or church any length of time. The first being the incarnation. <coughs> the second, the crucifixion. And the third, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now we're going to ask three important questions regarding all three of these events, because they all are extremely important events in the life of Jesus Christ. And we're going to ask these three questions to attempt to understand the significance, not only in the life of Christ, but more importantly, once again, in our lives. Obviously, everything Jesus did had an ultimate purpose to not only redeem us, but to restore us to his original intent for us. And so we're going to ask these three questions. What happened? Where did it happen? And why did it happen? So we'll begin with the incarnation, because that's where it all began, with the birth of Christ. What happened? A birth. A baby boy was born to Mary and to Joseph, although Joseph was not the father. A child was conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit. Where did it happen? Well, it happened in Bethlehem, in a manger stall, an animal stall after the Hebrew families were called to their family towns to register for a census in order to be appropriately taxed. Where did it happen? Or what, what, why did it happen, I should say? Well, the scripture says in John chapter 1 and verse 14 that the word became flesh. In the likeness of man, Philippians 2, 6, and 8. This was the very God-man. And it was necessary that the Son of God should identify with humanity as the God-man. Why? Only a man could be tempted and only a man could die. Next, let's take a look at the crucifixion. What happened? A death, an execution at the hands of Roman authorities as initiated and instigated by Jewish authorities under <coughs> false pretense. Where did it happen? on a Roman cross, on a hill, Golgotha, Calvary, outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Why did it happen? 
Jesus Christ voluntarily submitted to death in order to vicariously and substitutionally take the death consequences of sin, our sin, upon himself. But death could not hold him, for he was sinless. Acts chapter 2 and verse 24. Now it's important to understand that the objective of the incarnation and the crucifixion, the birth and the death of Christ, were to remedy the problem of man's sin by God to provide the solution to the fall of man into sin by Adam's choice. But I want you to consider this. If, in fact, the incarnation and the crucifixion were the only acts of God on man's behalf, then the gospel would cease to be good news. What am I suggesting? If the gospel narrative was only that Jesus was born and Jesus died, God said to man, there's the remedy. I came, I fixed the problem, now you're fixed, the slate's wiped clean, now go and do a better job. That, my friend, is not good news. That is tragic teaching. You see, the incarnation and the crucifixion alone serve only to condemn man all the more. Thank God it's not the whole story. You see, the resurrection life is man's greatest need. So let's take a th look at that third event in Jesus' life, the resurrection, and let's ask those same three questions. What happened? A restoration to life out of death. This reemergence of life from death is even called a rebirth. In Acts chapter 13, in verse 33, he, God, raised up Jesus as it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. The Apostle Paul, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, he, Jesus, is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Where did it happen? In the tomb that was discovered to be empty. And I've got a picture in the PowerPoint of the, the photo that I took when I visit Jerusalem in 2017 of what is to believe the actual tomb of Jesus. Why did it happen? To facilitate and enact the restoration of God's life in man and that by a restorative spiritual rebirth. Romans 4.25 states, He was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Now to this event, the resurrection, we will add a fourth question. How is the why question enacted? How is the why question enacted? And this is of extreme and ultimate importance. For this is what 
Christianity is all about. You see, Christian truth is not just the recitation of historical events. We're not just remembering what occurred 2,000 years ago, as so many are this morning. Christian truth is not just the theological of neatly formulated interpretation of those historical and even scriptural truths that declare those happenings. Christianity is not simply a message of merely what has been the past or what will be the future. It is the message of what is. What is? What is this morning? The very dynamic of the resurrected I am of God who restores the whole creation. That's the significance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christian truth is the vital dynamic of the life of the risen and living Lord Jesus. Living in receptive Christians today and forever. Do you see the ongoing reality of resurrection life? Amen. If we do not understand how the historical event of Jesus' resur resurrection connects to the living reality of Jesus Christ in us, by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not understand the gospel. We do not understand the gospel. You see, resurrection defines Christian faith. And so I asked the question this morning. How is the life of God restored to man by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because if we don't understand this, then we've missed the whole point of what we're remembering and supposedly celebrating, more importantly, hopefully experiencing. How is the life of God restored to man by the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus explained it for us. He explained that it's his presence by the Spirit that would be available to his followers. Now remember, when Jesus walked and talked and he had his disciples, the apostles, that he was with them, but he wasn't an indwelling reality. And that was their problem. They did not have the indwelling presence of God. They did not have life as God intended man to have. God had not restored man yet to the original intent of what had been lost by the fall through the first Adam. And so Jesus tells us in John 14, verses 16 and 17, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. What was Jesus saying to those disciples? He was saying, I'm abiding with you right now. You know me. Soon I will become your abiding presence. But that would only be realized through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, the promise of the Spirit was explained again in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. 
you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. That was the promise. The promised spirit of Christ appeared on Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves. And they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Peter explained what happened in Acts chapter 2, verse 29 and following. Peter declares, he, David, looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he was poured forth this which you both see and hear. He was talking about this outpouring of Pentecost. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but it was he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ this Christ whom you crucified. Wow. That was the declaration of the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. Paul also confirms in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 45 when he says, The last Adam, Jesus, became, listen, life-giving spirit. Guess what the life-giving spirit is? It's the very resurrection life of Jesus Christ. Paul again declares in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, the spirit gives life. What do you think the Holy Spirit, what kind of life do you think the spirit is giving us? The resurrection life of Jesus Christ. Paul declared in Romans 1.4, He has declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Once again, he's declaring the resurrection life. <coughs> Romans 8.9, If any man does not have the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Okay, when you received Jesus, you received the spirit of Christ. That's the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 11. 
if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. If that's not the resurrection life of Jesus Christ, I don't know what it is. And yet somehow there's this disconnect with us Christians, isn't there? John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. <clears throat> so the next question that we need to ask ourselves is, how do we appropriate that, resur that risen life of Jesus? Well, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1, 3, and this is good news once again, because notice, it's all of God. It's all of God. God, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Somebody needs to say hallelujah or something. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality of what it means to be Christian. And God's the one that's done it, thank God. John chapter 3, verses <clears throat> 1 through 8. Jesus declared, truly, truly, I say to you, that unless one is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You must be born from above. That's the resurrection life that ascended into heaven and came back from heaven in the form of the Spirit of Christ on the day of Pentecost. And when you and I simply receive and believe what has been appropriated by God through Christ on our behalf, we are spiritually born from above with the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. Paul declares in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12, we have been buried with him in baptism in which we were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him. Resurrection life. Colossians 3, 1. Therefore, if you have been what? Raised up with Christ. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. His resurrection life. It was the Apostle Paul's deepest desire. And he writes it. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, Paul declares that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. He wasn't talking about doing historical Bible study. He wasn't talking about some future tense hope of meeting the resurrection Lord. No, he was talking about knowing relationally the power of the indwelling resurrected Christ for himself. The fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may obtain to the resurrection from the dead. In other words, Paul knew that if I experience Christ, the resurrection life of Christ, then all that happens to me will be the outworking of Christ, and I will experience all that Christ had intended for me. Note the ultimate objective of the Christian life, as mentioned is not simply to get us to heaven and avoid hell as some kind of a fire insurance policy. God's desire is that we be 
fit for earth on our way to heaven. I would suggest the reason that a lot of Christians are not fit for earth, they're not experiencing a victorious Christian life in the routine daily things that they're facing is they're not experiencing and aware of the resurrection life and choosing to participate with him and instead they're trying to figure this thing out on their own. That's where the discrepancy comes. It's not that they don't have all that there is to have relative to being a Christian. They just need to become aware of the indwelling reality of the resurrection life and allow this Jesus to begin to live out his life through them. Isaiah prophesied in chapter 43 and verse 7 that we were created for his glory, experiencing we, he, intend, he intended us to experience his resurrection life. And Paul declared in chapter 1 and verse 27, this is the mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery is you and I, right now, today, this moment, we get to experience the living reality of the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. I can't say it enough to try to shake us out of our lethargy, out of our, our apathy, to begin to help us to understand that you have Jesus' resurrection life within you now. How do you appropriate the risen life of Jesus and live by that life? John 1, verse 12 and 13. <coughs> as many as received him. That's simply when you, by faith, trusted Christ and allowed him to come to live within you in the limited understanding that you had. Thank God it was the work of grace. It was the work of God, not of anything that you did or I did. But as many as received him. Notice what the scripture says. To them... He gave the right to become children of God. Even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh. You had that birth. That was your, that was your first birth. What's he talking about? He's talking about the new birth. Nor of the will of man, but of God. John 3, 16. Probably one of the most familiar verses in all of Scripture. God the Father so loved the world that it gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believes, not just intellectual assent, but believes that God, through the incarnation, through the crucifixion, through the resurrection, through the ascension, through the Pentecostal outpouring, believes that when you receive the indwelling presence of the Spirit of Christ, you receive the very resurrection life of Jesus. Believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, we appropriate and receive Christ's resurrection life by faith, which is simply our receptivity to God's grace activity. Galatians 3.26 You are sons of God through faith. In Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For by grace, that's God's activity. You have been saved through faith. That's simply being receptive to what God did through Christ for you. That not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. There's nothing you and I could have done. Not as a result of works. So that no one may boast. For you and I. We are his 
workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. How do you think you're ever going to walk in the outworking of the works of God if you're not participating with the resurrected Christ who indwells you, who has come to live his life through you, that he might continue his work in you, as you, and through you for others to the glory of God. That is the Christian life. That is the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. You see, it's the Christ of history that is the Christ of experience. Christianity is participating in the continuousness of the life of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And I can't say it with enough emphasis both now and forever. You see, Satan doesn't want us to experience resurrection life now. He doesn't want Jesus Christ being able to freely do what he has created you to accomplish. He, he wants to hinder the Lord Jesus Christ. And he does that by causing us to doubt the living reality of the resurrection life within us. The resurrection is the basis of everything that can legitimately be called Christian. It is only by the indwelling activity of the risen Lord Jesus that the dynamic life of Christ continues to affect Christianity. <laughs> if Jesus isn't doing it, it ain't Christian. Okay? Apart from the resurrection, there's no Christianity. Apart from the resurrection, there's no gospel. Apart from the resurrection, there's no spiritual life. Apart from the resurrection, there's no salvation. Apart from the resurrection, there's no righteousness, holiness, or godliness. Apart from the resurrection, there's no Christian living. Apart from the resurrection, there is no hope. Do you understand why it's imperative that you and I not only articulate and proclaim resurrection theology, but allow for it to be lived dynamically through us? Resurrection allows me to live. Resurrection allows you to live. Resurrection life forces the character of Christ out into the Christian behavior right now. Without the indwelling resurrection life of Christ, there would be no Christian expression. There would be no Christian behavior. And if it wasn't for Christ in you, nudging you, initiating what he does in you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't participate with anything that he was doing. He gets the credit for all of it. God's ultimate objective for mankind is resurrection life indwelling in and being expressed through the behavior of man to the glory of God. You see, this is really all about God. This is his purpose. This is what he created us for. God's intent is that the resurrection life of Jesus Christ be a living reality in your daily life. You see, this isn't just a, an Easter Sunday morning message. This is the reality of what it means to be Christian. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, we've already referenced this, but I, I can't help but do it again because it was Paul's prayer for you this morning. Paul prayed that he might know and that you might know the power of his resurrection. The Greek word for power for resurrection is the word dunamis. The word in which we get in our English language dynamite. Dunamis dynamite. This is resurrection dynamic 
It's the resurrection dynamic life of Jesus himself. The supernatural power of God's grace revealing the Christ life. The resurrection life of Jesus in our lives. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead was God's yes. It was God's yes and amen to the restoration of his divine life in humanity. That was lost in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of the good, uh, fruit of good and evil and the indwelling presence of God departed. Man's greatest need was for the re restor restoration of the very life of God and that happened through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and it was poured out on the day of Pentecost and we receive him when we believe in him. God's solution goes beyond redemption in the death of Jesus on the cross to the restoration of God's life in humanity by the resurrection. God's final answer, listen, was not the cross. God's final answer was and is the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus' divine life overcame death. God, through resurrection, overcame Satan. 1 John 3, 8. The cross life is life out of death. Resurrection life. The resurrection is the message of life, the provision of life. Now listen, the resurrection, all of God's promises, think about that, all of God's promises and all of man's expectations are realized in Jesus Christ's resurrection life in us don't keep that on the drawing board don't keep that in the pages pages of holy script allow for the living reality of jesus to make that your living reality christianity is not a message of what has been past or will be future it is the message of what is now the indwelling resurrection life of christ in the christian it's not the cross, but the resurrection that is the focal point of all human history. Christianity is resurrection because Jesus is resurrection life. And because Christianity is resurrection, the two most important questions that you and I should ask ourselves this Easter morning are these, and I'll leave these with you this morning, as you consider them before God. Number one, have you received resurrection life? And number two, if you have, are you enjoying resurrection life? There are no more important questions for you to answer. Thank you.